Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for joining me today. I wanted to talk to you about artificial intelligence, ethics, and law. Um, I realize that not everyone is in the legal industry, but what we will talk about today is essentially artificial intelligence and how it relates to you um, in terms of your individual liability, in terms of your job, in terms of what the legal and regulatory landscape uh, you know, what, what that matters to you. And in that respect, we will cover some compliance topics, ethics topics, litigation, and other things. That said, I wanted to start this talk with a research paper that was uh, presented in 1950 uh, by the famous Alan Turing, who simply asked the first question, which is, can machines think? And this opened the question to um, the field of artificial intelligence, which is essentially asking, can I actually fool a human into thinking that myself as a machine is actually human if all that they see are my written responses? And this is how the famous movie, The Imitation Game, actually started in terms of a uh, semi-accurate uh, bio of... Um, this phenomenon. And it's taken about 75 years, believe it or not, for AI to evolve. And now we all hear about AI. We all have fears about AI replacing us. We all have concerns about AI making us faster, stronger, better, which everyone wants, right? Um, so with that in mind, I could tell you all these things. And um, you, know, you can see, of course, what's in these slides. We'll have a copy of what's on these slides. First and foremost, I wanted to say that in terms of a cybersecurity update, perhaps the biggest update here in America relates to the Securities and Exchange Commission. If you work for a publicly traded company that's registered with the SEC, or if you have customers that um, are publicly traded companies, you'll find that as of December of this year, they will require you to give annual updates in your annual reports as to your cybersecurity posture in terms of management, how your board of directors are overseeing your cybersecurity activities and incidents, and also things in terms of how um, your cybersecurity is actually governed. And in my consulting realm, I've talked to many Fortune 200 companies. And unfortunately, they are, for the first time, having to have cross-disciplinary discussions over their entire organization about um, how to comply with this SEC requirement. And the reason why I mention that is because I realize some of you are from here from Canada, some of, our, of you are from the US, and some are from Europe and perhaps other places. But um, it's safe to say that within the tech realm especially, the US is very, um, very significant. In fact, just the other week, I spoke to a colleague of mine in Portugal, who's a CISO, who works for a company remotely that is headquartered in the US and that is publicly traded. And like I said, for the first time, the CEO is demanding questions about how do we best review and even rewrite our policies and procedures since SEC is now going to look at, with a fine-tooth comb, how we are actually governing our cybersecurity program. CISOs that work for US companies are very concerned about their personal liability. Uh, believe it or not, the DNO insurance, the directors and officers insurance might not cover you unless you are named officer with the company, which is frequently a president, secretary, or treasurer. So what I would recommend, while it's not legal advice, I would say it's time to talk with your management and with your board and with your CEO and ask, if I do fall within the realm of SEC regulation, can I be indemnified? It's very, very important to ensure that you don't personally have liability. That aside, I also wanted to mention other developments that are happening in terms of cyber. For example, in the United States, I think we all know that if you want to do business in terms of cloud with the federal government, 
you have to have, as a private sector company, FedRAMP certification. And there's actually a nonprofit called StateRAMP, which is available at stateramp.org, where you can find out the state regulations that are actually certifying to standards that are equivalent of FedRAMP-like organizations where you need to actually certify as to those state requirements as it relates to cloud. And in France, there is a, another certification program which they have stood up, which is similar to FedRAMP, where if you want to do business in France and you must adhere to certain cloud security requirements and have that certification. So it's, there's sort of like a global feedback loop, if you will, in terms of requirements. That said, I also wanted to mention things related to something very important and near and dear to all of us. While I can't name the company, I could say that whether you're in media, entertainment, you're on social media, you are perhaps an executive, you are someone that is in the news or your face is on the internet. I think all of us nowadays, whether we are a public citizen or a private citizen, especially with databases such as PIMIs and others, um, unfortunately there are databases that are now scraping the internet for, to store biometric, biometric information on us, including our face geometries without our consent. And as we, we know, that violates GDPR, that violates things such as the Illinois uh, Biometric Information Privacy Act. In fact, there's a class action lawsuit from Illinois um, representing various citizens of Illinois that are taking action as to that, where they're um, biometrics were stored and used without their consent. And, um, you know, again, these are allegations, so whether or not this ends up being true, we'll see. But I think we're in the day and age where, in, in terms of AI, a lot of our personal information is being scraped. And um, whether it's our photo, our likeness, our voice, something else. And now AI can essentially be a chef in the kitchen, and as I will show in the later slides, it will generate images or photos or deep fakes that could be derivatives of us. And so Con Congressional Research Service recently published a paper about a month ago asking, do we need in the United States a federal right of privacy? And the reason why I'm saying this is that the U.S. sometimes influences other uh, legislation in other countries. And sometimes Europe, of course, very much influences us in terms of privacy. So that's why we need to keep in mind what is relevant. And that said, um, I wanted to highlight one thing that I have here on the slide. You see this in terms of a graphic, which is AI generated. And essentially what this graphic symbolizes is, if you're wondering what this LLM stuff is about, ChatGBT, Dolly, and all these other things, essentially machines through AI or otherwise, they think and they analyze in ways that we as humans normally don't do. But we as humans also process things in ways that machines might not. So, for example, the United States Patent and Trademark Office, we had a webinar recently that essentially said that, unfortunately, with AI systems, no one has figured out yet this safety thing. And I think in the day and age of driverless cars and other things, that is a really big concern in terms of safety. And my field, personally, is in terms of healthcare. And I have to say, do we necessarily want to give in to AI and buy into solutions where we're, it's the equivalent of a driverless car? Do we necessarily want to deal with doctors that are purely machines without human oversight? And so I would say, if you are a citizen of the world, if you have concerns about safety, we all need to be concerned about what we're actually buying into. Just keep in mind that driverless car and the fact that safety in terms of AI is not built in yet. And um, I outlined a whole bunch of things here in terms of privacy, and it's safe to say that with all systems, AI or otherwise, there's far too much cl complacency in terms of what we're doing as it relates to AI systems always being correct, always yielding the correct judgment. But I'll show you, in terms of the subsequent slides, how AI actually lacks discernment that humans do.
And that is why I would at least argue for anything that is mission critical as to your companies, whether it's in, in industry or human safety, we always hopefully need to have humans in the loop. And that said, all this I want to summarize in terms of saying that we need to essentially not only develop algorithms that mitigate bias, we want to develop algorithms that are based upon a wide data set that are representative and inclusive of everyone. We want to train AI algorithms on an inclusive data set. We want to test them in that way such that we mitigate drift from the original model and so that we mitigate bias. But also we want to make sure that in terms of things that are developed, that AI systems will always have our feedback. That is why when you use ChatGPT, for example, it reacts to whether you have good feedback, bad feedback, a positive sen sentiment, or even a negative one. And I would say, if there's one area of improvement for AI developers, just keep in mind that not all sentiment in various languages is expressed the same. We need to make sure that culturally we understand certain phrases and certain ways of speaking, certain punctuation may not necessarily be the equivalent to simply translated rote. So I, I would say for those of you that are in the development space, let's get together with developers that are from diverse teams, whether it's gender, race, ethnicity, or otherwise, and ensure that we have a more holistic picture because frankly, let's say if you're dealing with India or other countries where there are so many, so, many, so many different languages, things do get lost in translation. And if a person doesn't understand what they're consenting to, that I believe is a danger. But that said, I wanted to also highlight my last slide, which is to say AI ultimately, 10 years from now, will maybe look like this, where it will be in all of our lives um, some people are predicting, just like Dolly did, that I had asked Dolly, what will our future look like by 2030? And it gave me this image. <laughs> and essentially, we might be working alongside robots. We may be dealing with more automation in our lives. But what I would say is, while it's so tempting for all of us to keep um, going about with our daily lives and just thinking someone else will oversee AI, we have to realize that not all of us will necessarily take the initiative and audit those algorithms or push back. So I think that it's all of our imperatives for ourselves, our children, our relatives, our spouses, etc., to make sure that AI is modeled correctly, trained correctly, tested and implemented correctly for the safety of us all. So that said, this might be our future, but hopefully it'll be a peaceful one. Thank you.